Good evening. Let's stand and worship our God who is forever faithful. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Oh, sing praise, oh, sing praise, oh, sing praise, oh, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever from the rising to the setting sun his love endures forever and by the grace of god we will carry on his love endures forever of oh, sing praise oh, sing praise Sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. Let's give him praise for that tonight. Amen. You can be seated. Come on, let's stand and worship the name of Jesus tonight. There's no sweeter name. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than I've ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than I've ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. Us. You are life. 
life to my heart and my soul as you are light to the darkness around me as you are the hope to the hopeless and broken as you are the only truth and the way No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than I've ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. Oh, no sweeter name. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than I've ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. God, we thank you, Lord, that we can even, Lord, we can speak the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we don't even deserve that. Oh, God, but he came to this earth and died and saved us anyways. Oh, God, so we give him all the praise and all the glory. God, we thank you for this night. We pray that lives are changed tonight. Lord, we thank you for what we've already seen in Austin's life. Oh, God, we praise you for that. Lord, it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I mean, I don't know that all you guys know, and, and I mean, Savannah just got out of here, though. She gone. Uh, that, that, some of you, that's Corey's wife that was singing with him, and uh, I mean, this is public now, right? I, I've been public for a while. Yeah, right, right? So uh, she didn't just eat a big lunch. She's, she's expecting February, is that right, Corey? November. No, November. <laughs> this shows, shows, you, shows you what I know. Uh, she'll be mad at me for saying that. And uh, anyway, Isla, how old I, is Isla three? No, she'll be five. Five in January. <laughs> it seems, seems like they just got married, doesn't it? It's crazy. Uh, anyway, but yet this one is going to be a little boy. Little boy. All right, little Corey. Little Corey. So. <laughs> anyway, anyway, shows you what I know. Uh, you know, they say the older you get, things just happen a lot faster. Uh, and time just, it's crazy. Uh, if you have a Bible night, open it up, Genesis chapter 10. Genesis 10. As you're finding that, hey, the couple things I want to I remind you guys to be praying about. Uh, first of all, our, uh, the, the church that we've been working and planting over in Windmark Beach, 
you know, between Mexico Beach and between um, uh, Port St. Joe, they are set to launch the uh, last Sunday of August. So they're not far from that. Roughly, roughly four weeks, and they'll, they'll be launching their services there, and they've got a great core group, and they've been meeting and training and praying and doing all the things that they do. And so um, it's a great, great, great opportunity uh, for us to make much of Jesus Christ. And so make that a matter of prayer. I know Scott, Scott preached for me last week. I was hanging out with the teenagers uh, all week long, and uh, I went, Jennifer and I went thinking, you know, we have a kind of a relaxing time. Now, we don't stay on the campus with them. We're not that crazy, uh, but we just stayed about 10 minutes down the road, and we'll just go hang out with them, and uh, the first night, the very first night, because they, they drove, and we, we flew up there, and um, we got there Monday evening, early evening, so we weren't going to see them until Tuesday and about 10.30 that night, our 14-year-old son calls and says, we're starving to death. Uh, that I guess they had, they had supper very early. And the place, the camp that they normally go to, the campus, they have all these little uh, uh, grills and little snack bars and all that kind of stuff. Well, this campus had none of that. It had snack machines, not many of them. What I was told, not many of them. And, uh, and as Reed said, we all brought 20s. So um, anyway, uh, he's like, we're starving to death. And, uh, and he was talking to his mother, and she's like, well, we'll get you some food and stuff. He turns around, and he says, guys, my mom's bringing food tonight. And she's like, whoa, 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 it's 1030. I'm not bringing you food tonight. You're going, you know, but I'll handle it. So what we would do is we would make Sam's runs during the day. And uh, we'd spend a couple of hours in Sam's because, listen, we were buying for 153 teenagers. Yeah, you think your grocery shopping's hard. And, uh, and so we would spend a couple hours in Sam's. The first night we delivered it, you know, uh, well, you know, we just kind of delivered it, dropped it off, and left it with, I don't know who was in charge, to be honest with you. But what happened, I think, is the kind of first come, first serve. Some went through and grabbed up a bunch of stuff. And then those at the end, the more spiritual that were still discussing the Bible, <laughs> did, didn't have anything to, to get. And so my wife said, here's what we'll do the next night to ensure that everybody gets something. We will pack individual bags where they will only get a bag. We'll ensure that nobody gets all the stuff and somebody gets very little. And, uh, and so we spent two hours at Sam's and then we spent two hours packing bags. And then the last night, I said, I'm just going to Krispy Kreme. 25 dozen Krispy Kreme <laughs> donuts is what I, uh, what I took. You should have seen them uh, when I was walking out with 25 dozen. Um, anyway, Genesis chapter 10. I'll be honest with you. I've been in ministry now for 30 years. I was telling Josh this earlier. 30 years, I have never in my life preached from Genesis 10. The reality is, if we weren't in this series entitled The Beginning, covering the first 11 chapters, and I even thought today, maybe I could come and I could say, no, 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 we're done with it. It was only chapters 1 through 9. But I would never have randomly picked out this passage of Scripture. And at first glance, you're almost like, there's really nothing to learn here. Let's just hurry up. This is just kind of this genealogy. Let's just hurry up, get through with it, and get to the action back in chapter 11. Uh, most Bible commentators even say this, do not preach a message from Genesis 10 because in the uh, modern day church, it'll mean nothing to them. They'll find it boring and you will lose them very quickly. So we're going to test that tonight, okay? Some of you have already lost. That's okay. We're going to test it tonight because here's what I believe. All Scripture is profitable. All Scripture is important. That even in Genesis 10, we, we're going to see that God has some rich, rich truth for us. And so whether it's a mistake or not, we'll just kind of push on ahead in that belief. Now, I, I, do, I do confess this before we start reading this tonight. Uh, this chapter poses certain challenges. The most obvious, what's going on here? 
What in the world is happening? Who are these people? Where did they come from? Most importantly, what difference does all of this make? And there's another challenge. There are 70 names of which I will attempt to pronounce correctly. And, uh, and if you think that you can do any better, thankfully I preached a sermon on Sunday entitled Dealing with Mean People. And, uh, and it will help me. Um, but God bless you if you can. Uh, what does it all matter? Well, I think the, really the, the, the place to begin is the very first verse in answering these questions. Look at what he says there in Genesis chapter 10. In Genesis 10, just verse 1, we'll start right there. This is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. And the sons' names are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. So this verse is the key to everything else in chapter 10. That after the flood, there were only eight people living on planet earth. You had Noah and his wife, Japheth and his wife, Shem and his wife, and Ham and his wife. And so every person living on the planet came from one of these three sons. Look at the last part of verse, well, look at verse 32, the last part of Genesis 10. To me, it kind of summarizes the entire chapter. Verse 32, and don't worry, we'll come back and fill in the rest. Verse 32, these were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So Genesis chapter 10 describes what happens when Noah and his family left the ark. They reestablished, well, civilization. Now the three sons, they all moved in three different directions. They had children, their children had children, their children's children had children. And over those years, those descendants, they'll form families and they'll form clans and they'll form tribes and eventually they'll even form nations. Some of these nations, they will start uh, they'll end up develop, developing a very, uh, well, a mighty emperor, uh, empire spread across vast regions. And alliances will eventually form between these nations. And these are the various descendants of Noah's three sons. Now, some of these are going to be friendly to Israel. We know from chapter 9, if you were here last week, that some of these are going to be bitter enemies of the Jews. The tribes that we're going to talk about tonight are going to include the Canaanites. Again, uh, uh, Genesis 9 talks about that. They lived under the curse of Genesis 9. They end up living in the land that God promised to Abraham and Abraham's descendants. And here's what this chapter is going to do. And I even believe it's the reason why the Holy Spirit had Moses include this in the writing of Genesis. It's going to help the Jews understand why they had to annihilate the Canaanites without any mercy at all. So, so Moses writes Genesis chapter 10 for a particular generation of Jewish readers, and it's obviously selective in nature. For instance, Japheth, he had seven sons. We're going to see Moses only mentions two. The rest of them weren't childless or anything along those lines. He only mentions Gomer and Javan, and it's just that the tribes that sprang for them, they were extremely critical for that generation of Jews to know about. And so what we have then, understanding this is, yes, it is selective in nature, but it is an accurate account of the nations in and around the promised land during the life of Joshua. And what happens, uh, uh, you know, when Joshua conquers Canaan, or what you and I know as the promised land. Uh, Now, perhaps an illustration will help you understand kind of what's happening here in Genesis chapter 10. Um, Any of you ever played the uh, board game Risk? I love Risk. It is world domination. I love Risk. Uh, Nobody in my family will play Risk with me. 
uh, because I'm very competitive and, uh, you know, I'm not going to let anybody win. Uh, I'm going to take over the entire world. But if you've not played risk, what happens is everybody is divided up into different armies. And the armies have different colors, red, white, yellow, uh, green, black, uh, you know, a lot of different colors that are there. And the way the game, well, really, this is not even how the game starts, but... Uh, you know, it starts when you first roll, but what happens is one by one, you start placing all your different armies all across the board, which is the entire world. And so you have little regions that are there. I'm going to place some over in, you know, Western America. I'll place some down in South America and I'll place some, you know, at various other places. And so you're sitting there one by one, taking your time, getting all your armies into place. And this is usually what happens before the very first player rolls the dice. There's kind of like this silence and everybody looks across the board trying to figure out what everybody else is doing. And so you'll look across the board, and somebody may say, well, man, that guy's really strong there in Africa. I, I bet he's going to try to move up out of Africa. I bet he makes a move for Europe. Or, you know, hey, that guy over there's in South America. That's probably where we're going to fight, over there in South America. Or i got to be real careful. If that guy gets all of India, then the next thing you know, he's going to take over Asia. And so it just goes. And so there's that moment right there as you're, as you're kind of strategizing. You're, you're getting ready to roll and then all of a sudden you're just looking across the board seeing how everybody is laid out and then somebody rolls the dice and all the armies go into battle Genesis 10 is that moment Genesis 10 is the moment before that first player rolls the dice out it's kind of a snapshot of the ancient world that is showing us how the nations are arrayed in the Middle East especially around the Holy Land that that is what the world looks like before the quote game begins now again there are 70 different names mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 some of those names, people. Some of those will eventually become uh, names of cities, and others are names of tribes or names of uh, nations, names of people groups. But again, all of us can gain something from this chapter, and do you know why? This is our family tree. I can remember going to my mama's house before she passed away. And, you know, she had a relative that had written a book going down the lineage of her family. And, you know, and she would sit there and she would say, Stephen, you want to read this? Stephen, you need to look at this. And I would say, Mama, I could care less about that. And she said, like, you should care about it because it's where you came from. You need to know where you came from. I'm like, I know where I came from. I came from George and Diane. That's where I came from. See, see, this is important to us because this is where we came from. And so this chapter in Genesis 10, it, it, it's kind of this sacred thread that will sit there and join the earliest of the history of the earth with all of the rest of the Bible. Again, he's showing us where all the pieces are laid in place. The dice is getting ready to be rolled. You get an understanding of how the game's going to be played. And it's going to make sense for the rest of the Bible. And I would say ultimately to you and me. With that being said, let's first of all look at these lasting descendants of Noah. And there are three of them here. And I would say again, bear with me as we go through these names. First of all, we have Japheth. Japheth, and it talks about him, pick up in verse 2 uh, of Genesis chapter 10. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Mishik, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togomar. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. So we have after the flood, right? Here's Japheth. And it tells us there that Japheth's family spreads out north and, uh, and kind of uh, west of the Middle East. So you have the descendants of Japheth that are basically stretching out from 
India, through Russia, all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, kind of northward up toward Europe and even Scandinavia. Verse 5 adds the fact there that the, uh, the Japhethites, they settled in islands. They were mariners. They were fishermen. They were traveling. Constantly they were expanding their territory. If we had time tonight, I would have loved to have dig into some of the research that I did that actually even follows how these three sons and their descendants play out even into the modern day world that we know. But we don't have time to get into that tonight. I can tell by the look on your faces. You're extremely disappointed. Let's secondly look at Ham. Verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, uh, Havilah, Sabtha, Ramah, and Sabtekta. And the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, uh, Eretz, uh, Achan, and Calne, in the land of Shinar. From the land he went to Assyria, and he built Nineveh, Rehoboth-ur, Calah, and Resen between Nineveh and Calah. That is the principal city. Misraim, he begot Ludum, and Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtulim, Pathrusim, and Kasluhim, <laughs> from whom came the Philistines and the Kaphtorim. Canaan begot Sinan his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Arkite, and the Sinite, the Arvidite, the Zamorite, and the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. And let me just stop and say, where are the Franks, the Tommies, and, uh, you know, the Lindas? Anyway, and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon as far as you go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza. And then you go uh, uh, on toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zebuim, as far as Lasha. These were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. I'll tell you what, that deserves an amen right there. Ham's four sons, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Cush would end up being Ethiopia. Mizraim, that would be Egypt. Uh, Put is Libya. Canaan, we know Canaan, we read all about Canaan over in Genesis chapter 9. Canaan would be the Holy Land. Canaan would be Israel, the Canaan land. Verses 8 through 12, (coughs) excuse me, mention a son of Cush named Nimrod. You've heard that before. Uh, Nimrod was a mighty warrior. He was a hunter. He was a man uh, of a rebellious spirit. Matter of fact, the name Nimrod has many different meanings, but it means rebel. It also means idiot. I would assume a rebellious idiot is a very dangerous thing. Um, Nimrod was the Rambo of the Old Testament. He took over Babel. He took over Nineveh. The Babylonians and the Ninevites, they were some of the greatest enemies of Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, Nimrod was responsible for establishing uh, vast empires in rebellion against God. These empires would be filled with idolatry and greed. The way he kept power in these empires was through military might, and he would also use unspeakable cruelty. Look look there in verses 15 through 18. It mentions the various Canaanite tribes. Sounds familiar to some of you. These are the very folks that Joshua fought when he went into the Holy Land. They were very large, very powerful in Joshua's day. The Canaanites, we know they descended from Canaan. Genesis 9 tells us a very wicked father. 
inherited an awful curse. He possessed a very, very large area, and he established a mighty, mighty base of power. And the Canaanites prospered for a very, very long time. But then all of a sudden, the very words that Moses prophesied, the very curse that came along with them, they would finally, it would finally come true, and it would be a fulfillment, and they would be conquered, conquered and ultimately destroyed. Japheth Ham, here's the third son, Shem. Your favorite. Verse 21. And children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. The sons of Shem were uh, Elam, Asher, uh, Arphaxed, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arphaxed begot Selah, and Selah begot Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begot Almodad, Sheleph, uh, Hazamavith, Jareth, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, uh, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling place was from Misha as far as you go toward Sefer, the mountain of the east. These were the sons of Shem according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. And the only name left in chapter 10, in verse 32. Noah, praise the Lord. From Shem came the Assyrians. From Shem came the Hebrews. Uh, some of the Arab tribes came from Shem. And tribes that lived in parts of Turkey, Syria, and Armenia. By far the most important fact about Shem is the Messiah would come through the lineage of Shem. So here we are, we're at the end of Genesis chapter 10. You come to the end of Genesis chapter 10, then you see the human race is hopelessly divided, right? They're divided uh, into a variety of tribes and nations. They're divided into empires. They're separated from each other. And listen to me, they're also separated from God. But even while rebellious humans... Separated from each other, God continues to keep his promise across all these generations. So that's, that's the board, and we've all laid out the armies. They're in place. What in the world do we learn from it? What are the spiritual lessons from Genesis chapter 10? And this is where we'll spend most of our time. I'm calling this the table of nations. The table of nations. I find it fascinating to study this. And, and I mean, I, I'd love to dig in a little bit deeper and even kind of flesh out where all of this uh, ends up going. But we don't, again, we don't have time. But if you study this chapter, you'll find it fascinating. If you like history or you like geography or you like uh, kind of this unfolding evidence. Because we see God's hand playing here and walking and working across the ages. And as we view it that way, I think there are many different important spiritual lessons that we can gather even in 2022. There are three that we'll focus on. The first spiritual lesson is this, the unity of the human race. The unity of the human race. Now, some of you are like, well, that doesn't make any sense that that would be spiritual lesson number one because you just talked about the variety or the, the division or the diversity of the human race. After the flood... Everybody on planet Earth is a descendant from one of these eight individuals. That includes the six billion people that currently inhabit the Earth. 
the lineage can be traced back to one of these eight individuals. That we all are descendants from Noah and from Noah's sons. Here's the reason why that encourages me. That even though we live in such a diverse world, even though we are all divided in so many different ways, this division will not be the final word. That God does not divide, God brings unity. That God brings together. The human race is diverse in geography, it's diverse in language, it's diverse in culture, in skin color, in physical appearances, and even physical capabilities, the way we dress, the habits that we have. I mean, diets are different from culture to culture and from nation to nation, and we can spend the rest of our night uh, talking about all the different uh, diversity that we have about us, but those differences, as real as those differences are, and I would even say as profound as those differences are they're not the final truth that we're all branches from the same family tree that every person is related to every other person on earth you can take a blood from an Irishman, you can transfuse it into the body of a woman from Japan, and his blood will save her life. Researchers tell us this, that the human DNA is so stable that you can, two, you can take two people from any place on earth, and you can compare their DNA, and it will be 99.8% identical. That of the 0.2% difference, the visible characteristics such as skin color and eye shape and all those things, they only account for about 0.012% of the genetic difference. So here's what that means, church. It means that out of all these so-called racial differences, which seem so important to many people, they are so trivial to the point of insignificance. It also leads to many other important truths that we are all made in God's image, that we are all sinners that fall short of God's glory, that we are all highly valued, we're deeply fallen, and we are also greatly loved, and we all can be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what brings us together. Revelation chapter 7 tells us that in heaven, listen to this, that there will be people there from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, every people group on earth will be gathered around that throne praising the lamb that was slain not from one, for one people group, not for one nation, not for one culture, but for the world. And what a humbling, humbling truth this is. You'll find this hard to believe, but we as Americans can get so arrogant. I'll never forget on some of my mission work and stuff, you know, you, you're sitting there and there have been times that I'm like, hey, let me help you understand this and let me help you show you this. You're not really getting this. And over and over again in different parts of the world, in different cultures, usually it goes something like this. I'm not stupid just because I'm not an American. And then the South Americans would say it this way, I'm not stupid just because I'm not a North American. And then those in Mexico will say it this way, I'm not stupid just because I'm not from the United States. But boy, we sure are arrogant, aren't we? We act as though that we are superior to those people from other countries. And if you don't believe what I'm saying tonight, all you got to do is ask somebody that was born or raised outside of the United States. We are not genetically superior to people in other places. That was Hitler's mistake. 
Hitler's the one who truly believed the Aryans were superior, and I'll use his word, to the mongrel races that he said deserved to be enslaved and then ultimately destroyed. Here's what we know. Hitler was wrong. According to Genesis 10, again, that you guys wanted me just to smooth over and go to 11. According to Genesis 10, the foulest person on the earth is my brother. Part of my family tree. And one way we deny this is we'll use demeaning terms to attack other people. And we will use insults and we will use stereotypes that do what? They lift us up and they end up tearing everybody else down. But this is also uh, not only a humbling truth. I would say this is also an exalting truth. Because according to what we just read in Genesis chapter 10, all the kings, all the heroes, all the soldiers who marched in righteous battles, all of the wise and all of the strong and all of the good they're my brothers and sisters too can we just face it tonight our ancestors are a mixed lot they are heroes and they are villains in every family tree as i found out reading the book my grandmother wanted me to read every family has a chicken thief in their ancestry Every woman has a Florence Nightingale back there somewhere as well. Understand the truth that we're saying here. The unity of the human race, whether we're talking about a rich man, we're talking about a poor man, we're talking about a beggar man, we're talking about a thief, a king, a pauper, we're talking about a prince, we're talking about a clown, a murderer. There is one common lot among them all. The earth is one, humanity is one, and there is but one God over all. And guys, it is from that truth that we get a clear view of world missions. Sometimes we talk about this. We talk about home missions and we talk about foreign missions. For those of you who've been around for a long time, you know the North American Mission Board used to be known as the the Home Mission Board. And the International Mission Board used to be known as the Foreign Mission Board. And we talk about home versus foreign missions. But where does home end and where does foreign begin? My goodness, all you got to do is go out to Pier Park. These days, all you got to do is walk down the street, and there'll be folks there from six different nations, six different nationalities living on the same block. The world's come to America, especially Florida. And America's come to Florida, haven't they? Here's what this means. This world is my home, and all men are related to me that we are all in the same human family and it is so easy for us to grow narrow-minded and for us to say oh no, no no it's us four and no more just my kind right just my skin color just my culture just my language right just my people just my background just my tradition just my preferences and when you do it that way pretty soon you end up with a church with nobody in it but you Because nobody else fits there. And I would say one of the things that Christ came to redeem us from is our smallness. To redeem us from our littleness, our narrow-mindedness. Jesus said what? Go and teach all the nations. Jesus said this. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. And so Genesis 10 is a reminder to us that we have not been called just to care for those that look like us or sound like us. We have been called to care for the entire world. And that Christianity will not allow our hearts to be small, but instead Christianity opens up our hearts to the whole wide world of men and women. Why? Because we're all made in the very image of God. And so if we have narrow visions and we have these small ideas and we have these exclusive claims that we're better than others because of our heritage or because of our background or because of our skin color, then I'll just go ahead and say it. We do not understand the gospel message. 
And so that's the unity of the human race. You're like, my goodness, how in the world did you get that out of Genesis 10? I know, right? I was squeezing every drop I could. Let me give you the second spiritual lesson. The sovereignty of God over every nation. Genesis 10 emphasizes this truth. Why? By every nation are listed by clans and languages. Verse 20, you see there that every nation is listed in its territory, that every nation is called. You're like, well, that just happened by accident. Are you flipping kidding me? There's no way it happens by accident. I want you to consider the words that are found over in Deuteronomy 32, chapter 8. Deuteronomy 32, 8. Yeah, look at the screen. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance... When he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. So here's what history does. History testifies to us that God is in charge of where men and women and nations end up. That God uh, he, he apportions their places. That God sets their boundaries. And it's not just this Old Testament thing. This even carries over into the New Testament. Listen to what Paul writes. This is in Acts 17, verse 26. Or Luke writes. He says, For one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them, and the exact places where they should Live. Now, I love how the New King James, or excuse me, the King James reads in this verse. It is so picturesque. It basically says this in the King James Version. God hath made of one blood. What do you make of one blood? All the nations that dwell on the earth. He made of one blood. That's a powerful image. One blood. Here's what that means, that there's no such thing as American blood, there's no such thing as French blood, there's no such thing as Pakistani blood, right? There's no such thing as Israeli blood, or as Finnish blood, or as Ecuadorian blood, or even as Filipino blood. There's no such thing, only one blood. Human blood. That's what Scripture says, it flows in endless varieties But it is only one blood. And so it's against the evils of racism that Luke declares we're all from the same stock. Every single one of us are from the same branch, right? We're born into the same human family. And so this is the basis of all that we do, guys. This is the basis of this uh, Christian reconciliation that you hear me talk about so often between the races and the various ethnic groups, not only in society, but please hear me, in the church. And you know how it's also confirmed? Are you ready for this one? Common sense. Common sense. That the more you travel around the world, the more common humanity seems to be. Specifically, we're very different in our appearance, we're different in our background, we're different in our language, in culture, in customs. But if you scratch deeper, all of a sudden what you'll do is you'll discover that all people are substantially the same. And here's what I mean by that comment. You discover that there's no fundamental difference between somebody living in a remote part of the jungle and a corporate lawyer on on Wall Street, there's no fundamental difference between a woman in a brothel in Rio and a refined graduate of Harvard. That every single where, where, one blood, we're all the same. We have the same longings. I'm telling you, I've been in some crazy parts of the world. I've found that we have the same regrets. We have the same dreams. We have the same hopes that every people group I've ever ever been a part of and and ministered to, I have found that every single one of them has the need to love and to be loved. They have the very same desire to bear children and to raise a family. And they have the very same sense of desire inside of them that there is some kind of God who made us. 
And as long as we live together on the earth, we know there'll be various races, various colors, various pigments and backgrounds and languages and cultures and these differences. Hear me, I'm not saying they're evil. I'm not even saying we we should ignore them. And I'm certainly not saying that we should belittle them. There's a lot for us to appreciate in all the various differences in humanity But I want to make one point extremely clear to the Wednesday night super spiritual crowd. There's only one race before God. The human race. The human race. Secondary differences do not matter to God in the same way that they matter so much to earth. We all descend from the same person. And when you do that, there is no room for a feeling of superiority over other people. Right? That we're all in this together. In what together? In life. What draws us together? We are all in need of the saving touch of Jesus Christ. And guys, listen to me. I'm telling you, it is the church that has not gotten this. Over the centuries and generations, it is the church that has been in opposition to Genesis 10. So there's the unity of the human race. There's the sovereignty of God. Let me give you the last one. I think you have nine minutes, right? The narrowing of God's purposes. So, so, so we're all the same, right? One race. That God's sovereign over it all. And then now we're going to narrow down from this this huge board. We're going to narrow down to, it's kind of like God's funnel. You guys know what a funnel is. You know, probably like a lot of you guys after the hurricane was running my refrigerator and my lamp. My lamps and a fan off of my generator. And then eventually, uh, we, 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 we got it. Um, what is the best terminology? Um, rigged to where the ceiling fans would run. Uh, and um, anyway, but, you know, you had to make sure that generator was filled with gas, was filled with gas, unless you had a natural gas tank, and then you could rig it into that. Um, Fill it with gas, fill it with gas, fill it with gas. And so I had all these gas tanks, like you guys had all these gas tanks. And then after the hurricane, I'm like, my goodness, I gotta do something with all these gas tanks. And so, you know, we started going to some places, doing some disaster relief, and we were sending gas tanks filled with gas and all that. I mean, we broke every kind of state and federal law in the world, hauling that gas down to southern Louisiana and Kentucky and all the places that we went. But Anyway, so, so when it was all said and done, I'm left with one gas can. And I'll tell you how selfish I am. I kept the nicest one. Right? You know, the one where all you got to do is you just get the very end of it in it. It's got the little lever on it to where you push it against the side of the tank. And you don't even have to worry about it because the, the, the nose is so far down in there. And it's just push and it just flows in that. Well, in all of my haste, all of the... Uh, fittings and all of the inside of that little handle and that little spout I threw them away so when you when you when you take that and you put it into the side of your mower yes you push down on that little lever yes gas will go into your mower gas will go into the tank and gas will go all over the tank and all over the mower and all over your shoes and all over the grass and so instead of going out and buying another, another gas tank, I'm like, well, there's nothing wrong with this one. I think we've got a filter in the kitchen. I'll just go get that. Now, I will be honest with you. Once I took it out of the kitchen, I did not reintroduce it, reintroduce it to the kitchen. Some of you are thinking I'm going there. I'm not that dumb. You think I'm a nimrod or something like that? <laughs> and so what I do is I take that filter. And I'll take that big gas tank and I take off that really, really nice special pouring uh, handle on it. And then I just pour it into my funnel. A funnel takes something very broad and it narrows it down. This is God's funnel. 
It, it's, it's kind of what's happening here. Something in a wide area into a small area. It, it, it appears that, even though it appears that God is working only with nations, that the end of the chapter reminds us that the promise of God goes from one man to another. Right, right? So, so the line that started with Adam goes to Noah, and then it goes to Shem, and then on to Peleg, and eventually to Abraham. Thousands of years later, it'll kind of reach the climax with the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. So, so, so now, the flow of this biblical story moves from many nations to one man, Abraham, through which all the nations on the earth will be blessed. And how will this blessing come to the nations? Through the ultimate seed of Abraham. Who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of Genesis 10, we come face to face with Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you, that's where every biblical sermon must end. With Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the goal of every part of the Bible. I've never been able to understand, nor do I think I will ever understand, sitting in a place that is designed to give glory to Jesus Christ, in a service that is to worship Jesus Christ, as someone speaks about a book that tells over and over the love letter of Jesus Christ, and yet Jesus Christ is never mentioned. He's the goal of every part of the Bible. And Genesis 10 ends with the nations divided. Genesis 10 ends with rebellion against God. And to a world in rebellion, you know what God's saying? I love you, I love you, I love you. Do you know what Genesis 10 is? Do you know the reason why we don't skip over Genesis 10? It's the message of the gospel. Do you know what Genesis 9 was? The message of the gospel. Do you know what Genesis 11 will be? The message of the gospel. Written on every single page. And so what it does is, even in Genesis 10, it gets us to the point where we have to ask a very, very personal question. So if God has arranged all the events of history to bring Jesus flesh into the world, then eventually you have to answer the question, what have you done with Jesus? What have you, what have you done with Jesus? And you know what truth says? Well, truth demands a response to that question. This is all just an academic exercise on a Wednesday night if it doesn't lead us to the truth of Jesus. We've talked about some cool things. And all oh, those people settled over there, really? Nimrod, I've heard that. I kind of thought it was a bad word, but the preacher says it, so I guess it's okay. We, we, we've just wasted time. I would dare say probably not smarter if it doesn't lead you to a personal faith in Christ. Something so simple, yet so deep. History is his story. You cannot live without him. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And so here's what that means. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter where you came from. It does not matter what family or what group or what clan or what tribe or what race or what nation you came from. Jesus is the only way. 
You might be a beggar on the street corner in Calcutta or a businessman in a high rise that's in Singapore. You might be a taxi driver that is in Madrid. You might be a, a farmer in Belarus. You, you, you might be living in a village in Chad or you might be an entertainer in a nightclub in Quito. You, you, you could be a homemaker in Dallas. You could be a school teacher in Montgomery. You'd be married or single. You can be rich. You can be poor. You can be male or female. You are we used to be male or female. You could be old or young. You could be healthy or very sick. The specific circumstances of your life do not change the fundamental fact that every single one of us were born, as Ecclesiastes says, with eternity in our heart. Here's what that means. A desire to know the God who made us, but most of the people living on planet earth do not know his name. His name's Jesus. And not one of us can claim that. And so here's the question you've got to answer. What have you done with Jesus? You cannot live without him. Just saying, guys. All the way back in the beginning, it was always the gospel. It was always Jesus. And may we be reminded, we're all one big family. That one that you hate, that's your sister. Some of you are like, no, legitimately, it is my sister. No, 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 hang on. You missed the point. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. No matter what our pigmentation is, you cut us, we all bleed the same. Because there's one blood that can only be redeemed by one blood. Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? What have you done? What have you done with Jesus? Have you received him as Savior and Lord? We heard a testimony earlier in this service from one of our teenagers he knew about Jesus he could tell others about Jesus his whole life been a part of a church that taught about Jesus but finally he came to the realization you know what I don't know Jesus well he doesn't have to say that anymore and I'm saying that's true for everybody in this room You have life because you have a God that loves. You're here tonight because you have a God that loves. You have one that died and took your place on the cross because of a God that loves. And tonight, you have been offered an invitation, a gift of forgiveness a gift of healing, a gift of eternal life because of a God who loves you. What will you do with Jesus? How about tonight? You hold up your hands and you just say, I give up. I surrender to you, Jesus. In just a moment, we'll stand, we'll sing. There'll be pastors down front. We invite you. If you're here tonight and you say, you know what? I don't know that I know Jesus. Please don't leave here that way. Let us have a conversation with you and share with you how you can know that you're in Christ. And then there are many of you that are here that God has been speaking to your heart tonight about something that maybe I didn't even talk about. Through me trying to pronounce one of these really hard names, the Holy Spirit of God just started squeezing on your heart. There's something supernatural that he does when his people gather together. But tonight, as he has been speaking and drawing and wooing and moving in your life, he has been calling you to obedience. Whatever that looks like, whatever area that is. There are others that he has been laying upon your heart. Someone that you've had problems with that instead... Instead of holding on to that, you should release that and you should love. Others of you in this room that he has laid upon your heart 
a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a classmate, whatever it may be, that you don't know what their spiritual condition is, or you know their spiritual condition, that if they were to die today, they'd go to hell. And the Holy Spirit of God has so laid their name and their face on your heart. Tonight, would you intercede on their behalf? Would you pray for the miracle of their salvation? Maybe you've been praying for a long time, and you've thought, well, maybe I should give up. It's doing no good. Can I just plead with you? Don't give up. Don't give up. Continue to cry out and intercede. But the altar will be open if you would like to come and pray. You're invited to. Oh God, may you speak. May we listen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that even in Genesis 10, you give us rich, rich food. And thank you that even in Genesis 10, we're reminded it is all. Jesus. And that's who we pray through tonight. Jesus. Amen. Would you stand here?